some of you. Um, I'm really glad you're all here, here at the beginning of the semester. Um, like Zach said, if you've never been to one of these before, um, I'm going to walk through a number of slides, and I know y'all are like, awesome, a professor and slides. Well, just what I needed all week. Um, the, my goal, I'm not going to be in the mode of like, here's what you should think, because this is my opinion. Like, the, my goal is much more to kind of set the stage and then let questions and dialogue uh, uh, kind of commence from there, both in this room and then afterward. Make sense? Okay. Somebody, before we keep going, any ideas on what the I word is? Inerrancy, yes, this is a word, it's a, it's a buzzword you'll hear just used to describe the Bible, especially in churches in North America. We'll say the Bible is inerrant. That's a weird word, inerrant. So inerrant means no errors, right? When we say the Bible has authority, one of the ways that you'll sometimes come up with that is by saying that it's inerrant. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight because it's a controversial word that actually dominates a lot of these discussions within our churches. Um, on some of these slides, you're going to see a picture of, who's this? This is Bender, yeah, from Futurama. If you don't know who that is, then watch some Futurama. Um, and whenever you say Bender, this is a kind of a sign that, we, that might be a slide we want, might want to come back to and discuss later, uh, later uh, as soon as I'm done. Does that make sense? Okay. So kind of take notes, think like, mm, I don't know about that. So <clears throat> let's talk broadly about the, the concept of authority. I don't know if this is quite working. Zach, hold on. Let me try again. Did you ever get to work? <laughs> Maybe I'm too far away. Maybe it's out of batteries. No one knows. Okay, there it goes. It did something because I got close. Okay, if you think of the word authority... Um, Americans tend to be anti-authoritarian, right? Uh, my, I'll never forget my father telling me, like, I used to always wear my seatbelt, but then they made a law that I had to, and now I don't do it anymore. Um, so uh, we really liked, Americans, we tend to be kind of anti-authority. Uh, we really like the phrase, you're not the boss of me. In fact, our founding document basically says, you're not the boss of me, right? So the idea of an authority, we, we really don't like it when you hear someone make an appeal to authority. We're like, I don't like that. Why should I do that? Because I said so. Oh, yeah? Who are you? The king of England? Because you are the king of England, and I declare independence from you, right? So, so we don't like the idea that something has authority. But when it comes to our knowledge of God, if we didn't have some kind of authority, then we'd kind of all be speculating, like, I don't know. What do you think God is like? I don't know. And we'd all just speculate. And so one of the things Christians are committed to is the idea that the Bible is our only authority, our authority that tells us what, what God is like. You say, how do I know anything about God? It's not because I'm smart, not because I speculate better than you, but because I actually have some kind of source of revelation, something that tells me about what God is like. So then you say, okay, so if I want to know what God is like, I go to the Bible. We say the Bible is the Word of God. We say the Bible is divinely inspired. And so we say, well, that's interesting. So what does that mean about the Bible? And one of the, the controversies that's gone on in the North American Christian context is this question of, of, of authority, right? Uh, uh, this actually shows up way back in the day. This is Augustine of Hippo, one of the smartest people who ever lived. Um, he says, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and you reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospel you believe, but yourself, right? What this means is that, like, if you take the Bible and you say, I like this, I don't like that, then who's the authority? You are, right? Um, but if the Bible is the authority, that may mean you are reading along the Bible and you say, like, I don't like that. But I'm not the boss. I'm not the authority. I actually am obligated to believe this because that's what God says. And he actually has that authority to tell me the way things are. Right? So this is a difficult thing for us to subject ourselves to. So people have kind of said, like, okay, how does that work? I don't know. <clears throat> and the, 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 the go-to word that people frequently use is this word, inerrancy. Um, I think a lot of my animations may have disappeared, but that's okay. Um, so what is inerrancy? Inerrancy is this fancy word, and mostly this, this word has been in common usage since the late 70s. Uh, but you could argue that it goes all the way back. Uh, this guy, Wayne Grudem, um, was one of the people who's really involved in, in, in uh, pro propagating this word, and he says this, The inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts, properly interpreted, does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. Now, each one of those pieces are important. If you find a copy of the manuscripts, we don't have the original manuscripts. We have many, many, many copies, and some of them have mistakes in them. That's okay. Right? And Nancy says, it's only the original manuscripts that matter. Um, properly interpreted, that means if you misinterpret something, that's on you, that's not on the Bible. Right? You have to interpret it correctly. And it doesn't affirm. And these words, properly interpreted and affirm, are going to do a lot of work. That's what you're going to see as we go forward. And so, basically, if you boil this down, what I tell my children is, the Bible doesn't say oops. Right? God doesn't say oops. The Bible is divinely inspired, so the Bible doesn't say oops. And we'll see how that kind of cashes out. Um, you can imagine why that's the case, right? God is God. Why would God make an oops? Why would God make an error? Well, there's nothing that he doesn't know. There's nothing that he runs into that surprises him. When we make an oops, we are surprised. Like, oop, I misspelled that word. 
Didn't know that, right? That doesn't happen to God. And the Bible actually makes these kind of claims about itself. The promises of the Lord are the promises that are pure. Silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in Him, right? Every word of God proves true. So this is the idea. Um, you can actually go to the, to the Bible and uh, actually look at the words of Jesus to get at this. Let's see if this thing works. So this is a good, pa- a good page to come back to. Good. So <clears throat> in, uh, in Jesus' words, Jesus will sometimes talk about inerrancy. Um, as it relates to the Old Testament, right? No New Testament when Jesus is walking around. It's about to be written later about Jesus. But when Jesus refers to the Old Testament, he says things like this. He answers his critics, you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. If you knew the scriptures, you would be right. Um, Similarly, another case where where, uh, people are trying to trick Jesus and uh, the Jews said, hey, it's not for a good work. We're going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus says, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods, and then they're confused. He says, if you call them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent to the world, you're blaspheming? Right? See that Jesus just assumes in his argument. He assumes along the way. Like We all know scripture can't be broken. So Jesus, in his time, would look at what we now call the Old Testament and say, like, this is the word of God. It doesn't make mistakes. Right? We know that, that scripture cannot be broken. If you knew the power of, If you knew the scriptures, you would not... You would not err, right, because the scriptures are authoritative and they, they don't make mistakes. Um, we then later actually extend this to the writings of the New Testament. That's a, maybe a conversation for a separate day about how the canon or the list of the books in the New Testament came to be. But the, 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 the verse people qu- frequently come to is this one, 2 Timothy 3.16. This is a good one to memorize. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God. So sometimes we say the Bible is divinely inspired. This almost seems to say the, the Bible is divinely expired. God breathes it out. The breath of God is frequently used in Scripture. God breathes life into Adam. So the same idea is there that, that the Bible is God's Word. It's breathed out by God, and it's profitable for all these different things, right? So this is uh, kind of the go-to verse. And so this is why people would say that the Bible is inerrant. It's divinely inspired. It doesn't make mistakes because God doesn't make mistakes. Okay, now, we're gonna ha- now that I've given you this broad view of inerrancy, the Bible doesn't make mistakes, I'm now going to spend a whole bunch of slides modifying that. Because some of you should say, like, wait a minute. A human is involved in writing the Bible down, right? God doesn't just say, kazap, boom, Bible. A human is involved along the way. So that means there is a human author and a divine author. And like, how do these two go together? I think this reformatted along the way. But it says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, uh, but men were carried... Well, how does it... Say? No, see, now I've messed myself up. Somebody look it up for me. <coughs> uh, men were, uh, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here, let's get rid of El Greco there. <coughs> there we go. Thank you. Look at that. We made an error. How look at that. Um, so, <laughs> no scripture, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you see the problem. We think like, to err is human. So if humans are involved, then there's going to be errors. But then this seems to say like, yeah, but people are involved, but men spoke from God as if they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's like, how does that work? I don't know. Our if there's a human author and a divine author, so do humans make mistakes? Human seems to make mistakes to me, so I don't know how this works. So that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty, is that a human is involved along the way as well. So we say biblical authority, we'd say the reason it's inspired and the reason it's authoritative is because the Holy Spirit inspires it. But we don't quite know how it works. How many of y'all have used this lovely little button on your phone before? Uh, do you love that little button? No. I sure don't. Uh, it especially seems to not be great at Texan accents, I will say. You know, you try to speak to it, and it auto-corrects to all these horrible things that you didn't mean to say, like, oh, I didn't mean to send that. And so some people think, like, well, maybe the Bible was, like, dictated by God. This is actually what Muslims teach about the Quran, right? You know, whatever God says, boom, straight onto the page. So we actually don't believe that the Bible was dictated word for word. That means um, the human authors, if you read different, different books of the Bible, you can tell that Paul writes differently than James or from John, right? They each write in their own voice. They have their own personality. So this is not dictation. Paul is really writing. So it's not dictation. And so the doctrine of inerrancy would say, like, even though somehow the human author is writing in their own voice, they're not like a puppet. They're not uh, just merely transcribing what they're told. Um, At that same moment, the Holy Spirit preserves the text from error. That's the idea, okay? And y'all should be thinking, like, how does it work? I don't know, right? Um, we We can also say that inerrancy allows for Ordinary language of everyday speech. Um, how many of you in the room are majoring in math or physics or engineering? Okay, a lot of you. Oh, my word. Okay. 
Um, it may bother you to find out there's actually a place in the Old Testament where it talks about the dimensions of some kind of circular tent, and it seems to imply that pi is three. <laughs> and, and of course, we're all like, oh my word, like I'm going to pass out. <laughs> they rounded. Is that okay? Is that an oops? The, the author would say like, yeah, close enough, right? So that sort of thing, we have to say that sort of thing is allowed. Loose quotations. We expect uh, if a reporter says so-and-so said this, that it is a dead-on quotation. But many times in the Bible, you'll actually tell that this is not a dead-on quotation, that it is a summary, that they paraphrase. The person says this, and I wrote down this. And we think like, oh, is that okay? It is okay. From their context, the way they're, the genre they're writing in, a loose quotation where they give you the gist of what that person said without being word for word is okay, right? We actually do this all the time. My friends say they'd be here at this time. Actually, word for word, they said something slightly different, but the gist of what they said is that they would be here on time, right? So loose quotations are okay. And then um, this last one, unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions. Um, if you're from Texas and you have some elderly people in your life, you may be familiar with unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions. Um, this is Tommy Lee Jones uh, in the movie No Country for Old Men. I remember when I saw this movie, I thought like, I was listening to Tommy Lee Jones, and I was like, that sounds dead on like the old men I grew up around. And it turns out Tommy Lee Jones is from Midland, Texas. So it is legit, right? And he says, like, that don't make no sense to me. And you could be like, ah, that don't make no sense to me. I don't think that's grammatically correct. The, the, the old West Texan would be like, are they going to say oops? They're going to say, no, I said what I said. You can, you can back off. I don't care about your English gram grammar rules. So there's a little bit of redneck possibility, and there's some redneck Greek in the, <laughs> the New Testament. In fact, I think, Julie, in that, in that uh, interview you had with Mike Lycona, he said, you know, Mark, the Gospel of Mark comes along, right? Then you later have the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke will copy Mark at certain points, and sometimes they kind of, like, correct Mark's grammar a little bit. Because <laughs> Mark is more redneck than Matthew or Luke. And we have to say, is that an oops? No, it's not. So these things don't necessarily count as oops if there's a little bit of redneck Greek along the way, okay? So the reason, some of you may be like, but that sounds like a mistake. It sounds like they did something wrong. Why would the Holy Spirit, you know, use bad grammar? Like the, and it's because the human writes in their own voice and because we have to make sure that we're not imposing our definition of accuracy or historicity on the Bible. So <clears throat> my parents used to live in Australia. I have had the pleasure of driving in Australia. And if you're wondering, like they do, Drive on the left, and yes, that is kind of terrifying because your brain is constantly like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. So imagine that I went to Australia, and I said, listen up, idiots. You're all driving on the wrong side of the road. Let's drive on the other side of the road and do things the correct way. Thank you very much. What would you think about that? Yeah, you would, you would be like, I'm not with him. He does not represent America. Don't listen to him, right? That would be arrogant on my part because I'm in their country. I have to adapt to them. I don't get to impose my way of driving on them because I'm in their country. And the truth is, when you read the Bible, you are going to another country and another, another time. So you may say like, hey, when you quote somebody, you better get it word for word as if there was like a video camera on it, gospel writers. And they would say, hey, you came to my country. You came to my country and we're going to use my conventions on how ancient biography is written. See what I'm saying? So this should give us pause from getting on the case of biblical writers saying, hey, why didn't you do it that way? We're in their country, not the other way around, right? So if you go to Australia, you will have this experience. I'll never forget, I sat down on a plane from, from Melbourne to Brisbane, and this big, goofy Australian sits down next to me, and he's like, how you going? And I was like, how am I going? Where am I going, or how am I doing? And I hesitated long enough that he was like, you speak English? And I was like, no, I don't think I do. <laughs> so... To, su to summarize this whole point, a, here's a phrase that's been so helpful to me. This is from John Walton. He says, the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. So that means when you read the letter from Paul to the church in Corinth, you're kind of listening in on somebody else's conversation. The letter, 1 Corinthians, is written to the church in Corinth. It's not written to you, but it is written for you. And so you need to say, like, I'm now listening into a conversation in Greek. I'm listening into a conversation on Australian. And I need to adapt to their context if I'm going to understand it properly. Everybody with me? All right, good. <clears throat> you can imagine this, this shows up in a number of different ways. So we could say inerrancy doesn't make mistakes about science. So here's an example. Jesus says, 
He, he, tell, he says, uh, he gives a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man sowed in, in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it's larger than all the garden plants and becomes a seed, tree. And at this point, a botanist may say like, wait, 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 wait. The mustard seed is actually not the smallest. So here's the question. Does Matthew say, oops? He would say like, you have missed the point. You have missed the point. The point is not to give you a botany lesson about like this. He's just saying, well, actually. So if you find yourself saying something like, well, actually, to the Bible, you might be missing the point. So that's the idea. Matthew, in this case, would not say oops. Here's another example. The four Gospels, do they all tell the same story? By the way, if you're ever in a, if you're ever in a church, including St. Mary's here in town, always look for this pattern of four. Angel, lion, bull, eagle. That means the four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, and so if you read these four Gospels, and they're all beautiful in their own way, but they're not exactly the same, and what's interesting is they don't, they don't include the same stories, and sometimes they will tell the same story, but kind of out of order, a little bit out of order. So a good example would be the temptations of Jesus. So I, I hope you all know the story. Jesus is baptized. He then goes out in the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days. And then at the end of that 40 days, he is tempted by the devil. The devil comes and tempts him, and he, he does three temptations. One, he asks, he asks Jesus, turn these stones into bread. He says, cast yourself down from the temple, test if God will save you and catch you. And the third is he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just worship me. But what's weird is the order is different. This, this story shows up in both Matthew and Luke. And in Matthew, it goes stones, temple, worship. And in Luke, it goes stones, worship, temple. And so for us, we would say like, hey, what are you doing? You're telling things out of order. Matthew, Luke, like, get together. Which one of you is right? One of you two has made an oops. And they would say, like, what genre are we? Are we ancient first century biography? Yes, we are. Do we always tell things in chronological order? No, we do not. See what I'm saying? They don't say oops in response to your correction. Something similar happens uh, when Jesus cleanses the temple. Uh, you might th think, when in Jesus' ministry does this, th does this happen? Uh, in John, it happens very early. In the other Gospels, it happens much later, closer to the time of the crucifixion. And so that seems not to agree if, you're, if you assume that the genre of the gospel is to tell things in exact chronological order. But the gospel writers would say, nope, that's not my genre. I don't always tell things in chronological order, and that's my prerogative, okay? <clears throat> One way to think of it is, about, is, is like a portrait. So uh, who is this a portrait of? You can kind of see they're not exactly the same, right? There's some subtle differences. Uh, this one's much darker. His, his uh, mustache is a little bit lighter here than it is here. Uh, but we wouldn't say that this portrait contradicts that portrait. In fact, we can say the portrait, uh, the, 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 the artist in this case, is trying to uh, show us something about Teddy Roosevelt, and the artist here is trying to show us something else about Teddy Roosevelt. And if you get these two artists in a room, we would say they, they wouldn't actually yell at each other and say, like, oh, you made a mistake. You would find that each one of these two artists are trying to um, bring out something different about the former president. And you actually learn more about him by seeing both portraits than if you just saw one. The Gospels are actually quite similar. Each one is draw, trying to draw a, a different portrait. And you, again, you may think like, I don't want a portrait. I want a video camera of what Jesus said word for word. But that's not their genre. That's ours, right? And so we have to adapt to them when we go and read the Bible, okay? Okay, so now I've now notice I defined inerrancy very high, and then I made all these qualifications about how you still hear human voices. Now, I'm gonna, let's get to the controversial part. Is inerrancy actually helpful? Is it actually a helpful concept? Mainly, the way people have used inerrancy is as al al almost like a creedal formulation. Like, I can tell you for sure, if someone at my church said they didn't believe in inerrancy, they would probably not be in a pastoral position, right? If they're like, you must believe this in order to be a pastor at my church. The reason for that is if someone, you can imagine, right? If someone thinks that there are errors in the Bible, then they may, anytime they run into something they don't like, they say, well, I guess that's an error, right? Now you're right back to you being the authority instead of the Bible. So that's why inerrancy is a big deal. However, this has caused a lot of controversy about like what counts as holding to inerrancy and, and, and what doesn't. So <clears throat> let's say you read the Bible and you come across something. Who knows what it is, right? It, we'll call it X. Whatever it is in the Bible that you're like, oh, I don't know about that. So you got a few options. You could say, well, the Bible is wrong to affirm X. If you hold to inerrancy, this option is off the table, right? Inerrancy says, nope, that's not, that's not an option. So then you say, well, maybe I interpreted the Bible incorrectly. Maybe I got it wrong. And the Bible's not actually affirming X. Or maybe you say, maybe the Bible does affirm X, and even though I don't like it, I have to live with it. These seem like the only three options to me. This first option is kind of taken off the table, that when you and the Bible conflict, that you could say, oh, the Bible's just wrong. 
we need to keep these other two kind of in our minds, like maybe we have to live with it. And maybe we need to think carefully about how we interpret the Bible. We said early, you have to interpret the Bible correctly and what it affirms. So maybe we need to think through what, how we interpret the Bible and what it actually affirms. And this can cause lots of troubles. Um, and I'll actually use the example of Mike Lycona. Uh, Mike Lycona has spoken here at Rosho Christi. He's a professor at Houston Christian University, not too far away. And actually, Julie got to give a, a great interview of Mike just a few uh, months ago where they talked about this exact instance. Um, Mike, when he looks at this passage from Matthew 27, read this passage. This is in the context of Jesus' death. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So Mike, by comparing against other ancient biographies, said like the, some of these things, like the earth shaking and uh, uh, people who are dead being seen, these are examples of, of what are called, I think they're called portents portents in ancient biography, and it's very common, and it doesn't always mean that something you should take literally. Like if you had a video camera, this is not exactly what you had seen. So Lycona says, this is how I interpret Matthew 27. And a bunch of other people like lost their minds. They were like, oh, you attributed error to Matthew. And Mike was like, no, 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 no. I'm saying Matthew's genre is that this is poetic language describing the import of what happened. And they're like, no, no, no. You said that Matthew said something happened, but it didn't actually happen. And Lycona was, was, really went through a big controversy, and like people tried to get him fired and all these kind of things because they thought he was implicitly denying inerrancy. So you see the trouble, right? Um, <clears throat> that people were effectively saying to Lycona, I interpret this literally. You don't, oh, you must think that the Bible made a mistake. You see the difficulty with this, uh, this red statement here. It's saying, I interpret the Bible this way. Obviously, that is right. And so if you disagree with me, you must be denying the Bible. You should say, like, wait, you assume that you have got it, your interpretation correct. That is very possibly wrong. Defending your interpretation to the death is not the same thing as, inter as defending the Bible to the death. You see what I'm saying? Because we can be wrong. We can get our interpretations wrong. And so we should be slow to accuse someone else of denying inerrancy just because they interpret something differently than we do. Here's another common pattern. This has happened within my own denomination many, many times. Let's say I have three people, A, B, and C, and we'll take a less controversial topic like the book of Jonah. Everybody know the book of Jonah, right? What's the <laughs> Jonah and the what animal? The whale. the whale. This is a weird story, right? So let's say person A, they read the book of Jonah, and their take is this. They say, the book of Jonah happened. This happened, and I believe it, whale and all. This is me, by the way. I do believe the book of Jonah actually happened, and I believe it, whale and all. Person B says, you know, I don't know that the author of the book of Jonah actually intended this to be taken as a literal story that actually happened in space and time. Um, actually, it's much more of a, of a word picture, a story illustrating Israel's lack of mercy toward its neighbors and toward the people around it, even a, an oppressor like Nineveh, okay? So person B says, let's interpret it differently. I think the author of the book of Jonah didn't intend for us to take this as a story that actually happened. So let's pause. This person, B, have they denied inerrancy? No. They're just disagreeing with person, A, about interpretation, right? Okay. Now let's look at person, C. Person, C says, you know, <clears throat> ancient people thought you could be swallowed by a whale and then spit back out, but now we know that's physically impossible to actually survive being ingested by a whale. Ancient people didn't know that when they wrote it. That's okay. We can still read the book of Jonah and glean moral truths from it even though it affirms this thing that actually we now know, because we're scientific, we know that it actually couldn't happen. Do you see this person kind of is attributing some error to the book of Jonah? Like, well, you ancient people were unscientific. We are scientific, so you made a mistake, but that's okay. So I can still glean moral truth, but not scientific truths from the book of Jonah. Usually the person in this category is like semi-allergic to miracles. Like they think that miracles can't happen, and so, so they, 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 they're, they're quick to... to um, attribute error to the Bible and say, oh, that, that didn't actually happen. So what I hope you to see is this person clearly believes in inerrancy in their statement here. This person actually does too, and this person kind of doesn't, right? So you can kind of see A and C are going to have a hard time coexisting, but here is the pattern that keeps happening. A looks at B and says, so you don't think, you don't think an actual whale? You don't? You don't think there's an actual whale? You know what, person B? I think you don't actually believe the Bible. I think you're just person C in disguise. 
Your person's seeing in disguise. You don't think miracles are possible, and you're given some other interpretation to give you cover. That pattern has happened over and over and over in the North American church, including in my own denomination. And here's the messed up thing. That paranoia has occasionally been right. And, and that's what they did to Michael Cummings. Mm. Yeah, they said, like, oh, Mike, yeah, you're, you're, really you're, you're wearing it. Yeah, you're, 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 you're secretly C. Yeah, even though you say you're not. So it's actually kind of, ha so you remember Zach at the beginning said, we want to have a good faith discussion. A good faith discussion basically means you don't accuse people of like, you secretly believe this, don't you? You know, so it's very hard to have a good faith discussion if we're saying like, oh, you're disguising your real view. So this is a mess. Here's an interesting case. The Evangelical Ph Philosophical Society, they have this rule. They said, if you're going to be a member... You have to believe this. Look at this purple part. The Bible alone in its entirety is the Word of God written and therefore inerrant in the original manuscripts. That's inerrancy. And then the only thing they add is this. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each an uncreated person, one in essence, equal in power and glory. What's interesting is they seem to think like, oh, this purple part, like if we all believe the Bible, then we're all on the same team. That's all we need. We just say the Bible's inerrant and we should be able to take it from there. But then they kind of recognize like, oh, a lot of like ancient heresies like Arians would be able to affirm the, the purple part. So therefore, we have to add this extra part. We actually do need creeds. We actually do need to say what the interpretation is. So just saying inerrancy actually doesn't communicate any, anything because people can disagree in their interpretations, even in heretical ways. Okay? Okay. Go ready for the controversial stuff, and then we'll be ready to discuss. Okay, so <clears throat> inerrancy is a concept that's been out there. But in the late 70s, um, there was a, this thing called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. A bunch of scholars all came together in one room, and they hammered it out. And the famed R.C. Sproul, one of the truly great men of God of the 20th century, was like right there in the middle of it. I love R.C. Sproul. Sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but there is some stuff in the statement on biblical inerrancy that you might make you say like, ooh, I don't know about that. That sounds like you're saying more than just inerrancy. So let's take a look. Some examples would be this. They say, <clears throat> we affirm that the biblical record of events, discourses, and sayings, though presented in a variety of appropriate literary forms, corresponds to historical fact. Okay. Not quite sure what that means. Then they deny something. They say, we deny that any discourse, any event, discourse, or saying reported in Scripture was invented by the biblical writers or by the traditions they incorporated. You see, this is why they would go after Lycona. They would say, like, oh, this thing that Lycona was happening about? They're saying it's just poetic. They're saying that event didn't happen. Mm, you can't do that. But why? Why? If it's a poetic device, you see this goes beyond inerrancy and says, no, you must in interpret it in a certain way. So this is troublesome. As is this, we affirm that Genesis 1 through 11 is factual, as is the rest of the book. <clears throat> we deny that the teachings of Genesis 1 through 11 are mythical and that scientific hypotheses about earth history, the origin of humanity, may be uh, invoked to overthrow what Scripture teaches about creation. You see, they're now going beyond inerrancy and saying, you have to interpret Genesis 1 through 11 in a certain way. I will go ahead and tell you, I grew up 100% in this camp saying, yeah, you tell them. But now I recognize, like, Christians disagree with each other about how to interpret Genesis 1 through 11. And the thing that changed my mind, I read a book by Hugh Ross when I was a college student your age, and what he did is he listed, here's what the early church fathers in the 300s and 400s wrote about Genesis. And they totally disagree with each other. Like, Augustine himself would not be able to satisfy this little definition. And so once you realize, like, oh, man, throughout the course of church history, Christians, like, really disagree with each other about certain things, including how to interpret Genesis 1 through 11, this is going beyond mere inerrancy and saying, you have to interpret it a certain way. So you see how this concept of inerrancy can potentially be abused. Then here's maybe the goofiest part of all. We affirm that a person is not dependent for understanding of Scripture on the expertise of biblical scholars. I will tell you right now, I depend on my understanding of Scripture on the expertise of biblical scholars because I don't speak Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> I've actually, I had a friend of mine years ago who said, he, he told me, he's like, well, Genesis 1 through 11, you've got to interpret it literally because like, otherwise, if, if it's some like, uh, uh, mythical or, or framework kind of interpretation, how's my grandma going to get it right? So that was his framework. He's like, if my grandma can't understand it and needs a biblical scholar to help, then it has to be wrong. And I was like, your grandma doesn't speak Greek. She already needs help from... The biblical scholars. So, so this is this is a pretty big this is a pretty big leap to say that uh, uh, a person doesn't need to depend on biblical scholars at all. So, okay. <clears throat> so this is a good one to return to as well. So my takeaway message: inerrancy in its best form. This is what I teach my children at home. Inerrancy in its best form means that the Bible doesn't say oops. 
and we can qualify what we mean by oops, right? Telling a story out of order, you know, using even hyperbole, saying the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Those do not count as oops. Even using redneck Greek does not count as an oops, right? And really, inerrancy is often used as like a, a, as a stand-in for the real issue, which is authority. The reason people throw this word inerrancy around and care about it so much is because once you seem to admit that the Bible makes errors, then as soon as you run across that thing you don't like in the Bible, the temptation to say like, I'll just say the Bible's wrong. It made an error is awfully tempting, right? That's the reason people care about it so much. Um, like the Lycona situation, you should be very cautious about accusing other people of like, oh, you, you're undermining the authority of Scripture just because they interpret something differently than you. And this semester, as Zach mentioned, throughout the rest of the semester, there's going to be a lot of discussion about biblical criticism of like, wait, did this really happen? What, and, and so what I'm going to encourage you to, to do is if you encounter biblical criticism where they're like, I don't know if this is historical. I don't know if Moses actually wrote that. Blah, 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 blah. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. I'll tell you a couple stories and we'll be done. When... My, when I was maybe seven or eight years old, I actually noticed a discrepancy between two of the Gospels. There are several like, places where they don't contradict, but they don't quite match either. Like how many angels are there at the tomb? What order did things, things happen? I was seven or eight years old. And I'm like, eh, eh, what's the deal? And I actually asked someone at my church, like, what's the deal? And they basically said, like, shut up. <laughs> Somehow my father got wind of this, and I will never forget it. I'm going to pick on Riley for a second. My father, like, bent down, and he, like, looked at me straight in the face, and he said, you can ask any question you want. You can ask any question you want. The Bible can take it. And I felt so relieved because my dad did not want me to have a fragile faith. He was like, hey, man, you can ask any question you want. You can approach questions without fear. The Bible can take it. Years later, I actually studied um, early Christian history at Harvard Divinity School, a place that uh, is thoroughly post-Christian, I will tell you. And um, it was just fascinating the way that their skepticism meters were turned up. And that whole time that I was there, th I, I just kept thinking of what my dad had said. It's like, when you hear people say X, Y, Z, like, don't freak out. You can be confident in that moment and dig into the details. And when you get uh, confronted with apparent difficulty in the Scripture, it may help you read the Scripture in its proper context in a way that you never have before. So instead of looking at that as a threat or something to avoid, it's actually an opportunity to learn more about Scripture. All right, with that in mind, I will go ahead and close and open up for questions. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm certain you all must have questions. I will give one quick answer because this is always a question. Are these slides posted? Is there a recording? There's so much information. Yes, at the text <laughs> link, if you scroll down, there's a button that says View Presentations and Handouts. You can download the PDF. We have a YouTube channel that's linked. I'll upload it once this is done. No. There's that. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So how are we supposed to handle, like, um, when someone says, like, this is a mistranslation, so it sh must be wrong the way it's meant to say? A mistranslation? Yeah. So we are very fortunate in the sense that we have so many Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that we don't have to worry about translations. We can just go back to go back to the to the to the original text or the original language. And I mean, it's possible that um, if you have a certain biblical translation, it's possible they did something poorly. But we can compare against other translations, etc., and say like, all right, what does it say? Um, I will note that if you just walk around campus and ask people how the Bible is translated, you do frequently run into people who somehow have it in their minds that like, well, the Bible was translated from. Hebrew to Sanskrit to Chinese and then Spanish, back to Greek again and then English. Like they think that's how it went, like the telephone game, right? Where it goes, and that's not the case. We have so many manuscripts that like, if we lost all our biblical translations, we had to go start again tomorrow, like we could do it, you know, because people have, we have those Greek manuscripts, we have those Hebrew manuscripts, and there's so many that we can actually do comparisons and, and, and translate it well. So I'm not too worried about translations. The other thing people do freak out about is like discrepancies. Like, how do you know if there are different manuscripts that, like, disagree with each other? So I should have done this tonight. One thing I've done in the past is I've printed out, uh, like, 50 copies of uh, Philippians 4, and every one of them has a mistake in it, but a different mistake. Can you imagine? So we'll, we'll pretend I actually remembered to do that this time. Um, do you see that, like, if, if we had 50 copies of Philippians 4 and each one had a different mistake, at every word the vote would be, kind of be 49 to 1? So even if I destroyed the original copy of Philippians 4, you could piece it back together 
by comparing the manuscripts. And that's actually what biblical scholars do. So, and your Bible will actually tell you, like, if they're a little bit like, oh, I don't know. Um, so, unfor- sadly, the, the story about, you know, the woman caught in adultery and the, Jesus writes on the ground and the people leave her alone, that is not in the earliest manuscripts. And your Bible has, like, a little note. So if there's ever a case where the, where the translators are like, oh, I don't know, they'll make a note, and it actually says it right there in your Bible. There's only a couple passages like that, and that's one of them. So, sir. Oh, what a good question. How do we, how do we keep from, so the, there's, a, there's a couple of terms people use. Exegesis, that's where I read out of the text. That's good. And the, the, the danger you're worried about is eisegesis, where I read my own opinion back into the text. And the, the short answer is hard work. Um, what's been most helpful to me is to try to get into the minds of the original audience as much as I can, right? Jonah was written for an audience, and it wasn't me. So when I try to understand, well, who's that original audience? Uh, it's going to help me get closer and closer to the original text. So the, there is no easy answer. I think it, it's like you actually have to do the hard work of figuring out what's the right way to interpret this passage. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, at my church, I, I go to New Life Baptist, and we're, we're going through the book, The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey, a book I would really recommend to everyone. It's really beautiful. One of the things that I, had, I struggled with when I read that book is I always thought of the, the Pharisees as like cartoon villains, like, oh, what a bunch of jerks. But then when you start reading the context and learning like what was first century Palestine like, I realized like, oh man, of all the different groups around, like I'm the most like the Pharisees. Then they stop being cartoon villains and start being real people with real concerns who are shocked and surprised by this man, Jesus. And if I had been there, I would have been shocked and surprised too. So digging into that original context, what are the, what's the genre of the book? Who's the original audience? What would, he, what would the author have expected them to think? Those kind of things are, are the, the only answer, really. So. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean... I guess I would, so the question, if you couldn't hear, was about miracles. What about, what about miracles? I, I will warn you, um, in our 21st century context, there are a lot of people who are like, well, miracles, we all know miracles are scientifically impossible. Um, that's actually not a scientific statement. Um, so here's a, good, here's a way to think about it. Uh, someone would say, like, scientifically, we all know dead people don't come back to life. What they mean is, under natural circumstances, dead people don't come back to life. But the Bible doesn't say under natural circumstances a dead person came back to life. They said there's something supernatural happening there. So be careful not to go into like anti-miracle mode like a lot of people do. I will give you the illustration that C.S. Lewis gave about miracles. Uh, this has been super helpful for me. I encountered this when I was your age. But uh, any so engineers, who are you again? Okay. Any physicists? No. All right. So, all right, engineers. Have you ever solved a problem and they made you like draw a little dotted line around your work or around your system? Yeah. So let's imagine we're playing billiards or pool or something like that. And I say, I'm going to strike the ball. I'm going to strike it with a certain force. And the laws, Newtonian mechanics, the laws of physics say the ball is going to go off the wall. And it's going to go there. And it's going to go in the pocket. The laws of physics say it is so. I do the math. I got the math right. I'm going to be very precise. So it's going to happen. Science says it will happen, right? So then I hit the ball. And right after I hit it, you grab the ball. And I'm like, did we just disprove? So let's, here's the question. Did we just disprove science? No. When I did my calculations, I drew a little dotted line around the table. And I said, I assume nothing from outside the dotted line is going to mess with me. But it turns out that assumption wasn't true. Something from outside the dotted lines reached in and changed something. And that's a miracle. That's what a miracle is. Now you may think like, oh man, does God like reach in and like mess up our experiments all the time? And the answer is no. God only does it in religiously significant context. And I think that's what you'll find is that miracles don't happen willy-nilly. God doesn't say, la, 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 miracle, your glasses are gone. Like it, it doesn't, <laughs> your wallet's missing, have fun with that. Like they don't, God's not capricious. He does, the miracles happen. So here's a good example. When I was young, I used to think like, why doesn't Jesus just form an assembly line and like heal as many people as he humanly can? And the answer is that the miracle, the point of the miracle is not just the miracle. The point of the miracle is to establish who Jesus actually is and to testify to who he is. So that's how I look at miracle passages. It's not just the miracle itself. It's what does it say about God? What does it say about Jesus' mission? So, Sorry, that was a long answer to the miracle question, but I like that miracle topic, as you can tell. Yes, sir. Instead of, because of inerrancy, instead of uh, assuming that the writers were mistake, you could 
often said to either reconsider your belief and we might be wrong, or that the interpretation is, is different. But it seems to me that the spirit of skepticism from the you know the opposing view that maybe questions the evidence mm -hmm. is to say, well, maybe this is wrong. And uh, it, 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 it seems it, it, it is. Yeah, it seems yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's kind of protecting itself and saying, oh, we already assume, we, have, we, we assume already, we presume that inerrancy is a thing, so there is no possible fallibility, which destroys all possibility. I agree. I think you're kind of making the same point that Zach made at the beginning. Like if, if um, so, a lot of a lot of these inerrancy things that I'm talking about are kind of how Christians police things among themselves. But you're right, though. If a Christian is engaging with someone who's not a Christian, they can't go into that conversation saying, "Well, obviously the Bible doesn't make any mistake." They're actually going to have to defend that and not just presume it. I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, I would say though, so you're right. We can't just assume. Well, the biblical author definitely didn't make a mistake. We actually have to defend that statement. But I do think we do need to be charitable charitable with the biblical author. Give them the benefit of the doubt the same way that we would want to do someone to do to us. Um, so I, I don't know, I've seen cases where people like, they'll parse the language in 1 John and they're like, well, this couldn't possibly have been written by the actual Apostle John because blah, blah, blah. And the way, the language, the reasons they give, I'm like, if you applied that logic to my emails, people would assume that like, oh, the real Mike, it would never have written that email. And it's just not true. So, so we got to be careful about we gotta don't don't go over skeptical. Don't go and, and and go out of your way to be charitable to the biblical writer. I guess. Would you say that the inerrancy argument here is, is only kind of in the context of a religious person talking to a believer talking to a believer? Generally, yes. Okay. Generally, yes. Okay. Right. If um, if if a yeah, because if, if a if a religious person is talking to a non-religious person, they've got to start from like some agreed upon uh, fact, points. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, you'll note that, like, when Mike, Ly right. when Mike Lycona argues for the truth of the resurrection, yeah. he doesn't say, he just says, the biblical record is, like, historically reliable enough that we can conclude the following. Boom, boom, boom. And he doesn't say anything about inerrancy. Yeah. Sure. Oh, the canons? Yes. So the old, uh, that's a whole other talk, actually. <laughs> Okay. Oh, next week. Oh, okay. Wow. Seven days. We'll talk about we'll talk about the canon. Awesome. Um, yes. I won't. I won't steal his thunder. But that's a whole discussion unto itself. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yancey. Philip Yancey. That is a great question. Um, we're not certain. There are actually some people who've argued they think it's historical and that it actually happened, but it wasn't in like the original copy of John. So we don't we don't actually know. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know for sure. It's not all we know is that it's not in the earliest manuscripts. And it's, it's only worth noting that that passage is rather exceptional. Yeah. It's such a extensive passage, a whole story that doesn't seem to be in the original. Like that. That's very I think there's only two cases like that in the entire New Testament. It's the very end of Mark, I believe, like the last seven verses or so of Mark. Yeah. I mean, it'll, check in your Bibles. There's a little note there for sure. Yeah. I have heard that those stories were oral tradition. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? I mean, this is an oral tradition. Not everybody's literate. And so, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities there. I, that would not surprise me at all. Yeah. Sir. So when we're looking at um, sort of basing our interpretation on, I guess, literary devices that are custom to the genre we're mm -hmm. looking at and mm -hmm. when we're looking at stuff that's like as ancient as Genesis to where there isn't a lot of literature given that you know Hebrew was literally inscribed in stone and not everyone could do that what mm -hmm. do we have to you know look at and compare and say well, this is definitely a literary device that is you know common to this genre of ancient thousands of year old stuff that we right. don't have anything right about. so the word definite is probably out of the question, because people are still disagreeing with each other even today about how to interpret Genesis. I will tell you one comparison that is, I found helpful is I go to Genesis and I'll ask a scientific question like, how old is the moon? <laughs> but then you think, the original audience, what had they heard about the moon? If you go to ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt, other ancient Near Eastern contexts, the, uh, the Babylonians or the Egyptians are like, oh, the moon is a goddess. 
And then you go to Genesis. It says, no, no, no. There's one God. He made the moon, and it's a light. And I'm like, but, ooh, but how old are the rocks? They'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm, you see, I'm asking a question that the ancient audience doesn't even have on their brains at all. So that's what I mean, th- that kind of thing, that comparison of like, who are they comparing themselves against? Egypt, I found that to be really helpful. Yeah. So what determines what literature based it, or sorry. Like the genre? What is, yeah, yeah. What determines what's more like literature instead of a historical record? Oh, see, that's, yeah. You got to do the hard work on that. It varies by book and, like what you know. literary device is it like literal? Yeah, I mean, it's controversial, I mean, yeah. But I mean, what would be, what would be things that you would look for, I guess? Um, that's a good question. I think I'll open that up to the room. What would y'all look for to tell you that some, this may be a literary device as opposed to like a recounting of an actual episode? Uh, usually, uh, you see poetry, they would keep, um, so like, if it was fables, if they would continue to come up, that's an indicator that it's poetry and not, um, a historical record. Yeah, actually, as you were saying that, I was thinking of the book of Job. A lot of the book of Job is kind of poetic. And so for that reason, some people think the book of Job, like that Job is just a literary character and he didn't actually live. That's a possibility. (coughs) Other ideas, guys? Sir? I would say lineages are a pretty good indicator of a historical record. Oh, yeah, this person, uh, (coughs) father was this person, their father was this person. Yeah, that's a really good point. When they give a genealogy, that's a sign we're talking about real people. One um, one really helpful thing for me is, uh, you mentioned the problem of a lot of times we don't have. You mentioned 930? A lot of times you can tell things from the book itself. Um, like one of my favorite examples is at the end of Luke's gospel, he's recounting the ascension. And when he narrates the ascension of Christ back to heaven, he doesn't mention the name Christ. But then the same author at the beginning of Acts does mention the name when he narrates the same event. And so if we take the pretty natural assumption that he's like a reasonably competent historian that didn't just forget to mention it the first time, we can observe that he's doing that deliberately and helps us be more comfortable with that kind of spotlighting, is the term for it, hmm. in his writing. Oh, that's interesting. I saw another hand over here. Yeah. Um, on the flip side, the Caleb over there was talking about where you find it within the text. I like to pinpoint where historically was this written when was it written, and to start looking at texts around it, and then see, all right, I'm fairly comfortable with these are how the populace of literature looks like in between 400 BC and 300 AD. Does what I'm reading fit into that category? Sometimes, yes. And so I put it in there. Or is this a Greco-Roman biography? The Gospels fit that account, so I know the Gospels aren't the populace of literature. The Gospels are Yeah, lots of good examples. I mean, one, one really nice example of something you can tell, this is historical, is in the book of Acts. At some point it stops saying, they did this, they did this, and at some point it changes and starts saying, we. And now you know Luke is with Paul. We went to this place, and then we went to that place, and then we went to that place. And now it's like a diary. Like you can say, like, oh, yeah, this is definitely historical. I think I'll end with this, um, and then I'll, 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 we can discuss amongst ourselves. One thing that has really helped me when I encounter something in the Bible that I'm like, ooh, I don't know, I don't, I don't like that, is to think of like, uh, I, I as a Christian believe that the entire Bible points to Jesus. So if you read a passage like the, the passage where God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his son, I'm like, that's horrible. That's horrible. Why would God ask him to do that? And so um, there's a story that uh, Martin and Katie Luther were discussing the story, and Katie Luther was like, I hate this story. Like, why would God ask a father to treat his son like that? And Martin said, Katie, don't you get it? That is what, uh, the, the, asking a father to sacrifice a son, that is actually what God did. So this story of Abraham and Isaac, where Abraham thinks he has to sacrifice Isaac, and ultimately there's a, there's a, 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 a substitute who dies in Isaac's place, is not meant to be just a story to creep us out about God putting Abraham through all this. It's meant to point us ahead to Jesus. So a lot of the things in the Bible, you're like, oh, what is going on here? When you see how it all fits into a grand narrative that points to Jesus and who he is, then you start to see the beauty of the Bible. Uh, One name I haven't mentioned yet tonight is Tim Mackey. 
Tim Mackey is the guy at the Bible Project. And um, one thing I love about the Bible Project is they will tell the whole story of the Bible, all about, like, what does the Bible say about generosity? What does the Bible say about cleanliness? What does the Bible say about holiness? And they'll tell the whole story, and along every one of those lines, the, the, the narrative is beautiful from, like, 50 different perspectives. And I'm like, that shows the real power of Scripture, that it's not just an encyclopedia that gives us little factoids. It is a story about God's redemptive work in the world. On that, I'll close. Thank you, everybody.